Well, have you ever been reading the Bible in a passage that you've read for seemingly a a thousand different times, and yet on that thousandth time, you're just blown away by the fresh insight that you get from that same passage. And it's like when you're hanging out with a best friend or your spouse of many years, and they say something that just blows you away, and you're thinking, wow, after all these years, (laughs) and you still amaze me, you're so much more deep and complex than I've ever known. And that happens all the time as we read scripture, unsurprisingly, because the scripture is living, and it's active, and it reveals the very person of the eternal triune God. So if you're seeking the Lord in scripture, you are going to regularly be blown away by the fresh insight you see in it. And so about a month ago, I was blown away as I was reading in Proverbs chapter 31. I want to invite you to open with me to Proverbs chapter 31 this morning. And we're going to see how this old, Old Testament text is incredibly pertinent for every one of us in the New Testament today. Now, if you're not familiar with Proverbs 31, it's a text that poetically describes the perfect wife, all right? And so many times we hear sermons that are from women only to women only and saying that this passage is really about women only. And that's a wonderful thing to teach this passage to women. In fact, we have an amazing women's ministry at our church that is starting a new uh, Bible study this summer, uh, just this Tuesday night. Hope that everyone can go join that. I won't be there, but y'all have fun. Um, But today, as we look at Proverbs 31, I want you to see how this text is not just for the ladies in the room. It's for every church member in the 21st century. So we're going to open up the text and see first uh, how to understand, how to apply Proverbs 31, which was written 3,000 years ago, to our church today. In order to do that, we're going to have to see how these 22 verses connect from the Old Testament all the way to the end of the New Testament in Revelation so that you can see the glory of Jesus in every verse and so that you can see how these verses apply to you, man, woman, and child in this room. And only once we have that proper context, then we'll be ready to walk through the text together verse by verse. So in order to get that applicational context correct this morning, you may have to take off uh, two blinders that, if you're like me, you have come at this text with before. All right, so blinder number one to remove is the thought that Proverbs 31 is just for women, right? I already said this. Proverbs 31 is not just for women. Like Certainly, it's wonderful to look at this text and think, man, I'd love to be this kind of Proverbs 31 wife. That's an excellent thing to do. But more than that, it is also for young men. So in fact, the entire book of Proverbs here is written primarily as a set of instructions for young men who are going to become kings, right? So Maybe, like me, you've heard Proverbs 31 preached by a pastor on Mother's Day as if this passage were written primarily to mothers. But the opposite is actually true, right? Proverbs 31 is written from a mother to her son who's going to become a future king. See that in verse 1 of the chapter. It says, the words of King Lemuel an oracle that his mother taught to him. And she says, I love this, what are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? Probably sounds like some of your mothers right there. So if you're a man here today and you heard that we're going to preach from Proverbs 31, you thought, man, I'm off the hook. This is for the ladies this morning. I mean, the opposite is actually true. 
whenever women are applying Proverbs 31, and they are just looking in on a passage that is written to men primarily, especially men who would become leaders of God's people. And so, young men, today's your day to listen up as the perfect ideal wife is going to be described. Look at verse 10. It's the opening phrase of the poem. It says, an excellent wife who can find. She's far more precious than jewels. Now, here's where it gets good. Because not only would the original audience have seen this text as describing the ideal wife to young men... But I believe that if you read the book of Proverbs as a whole, it's equally obvious that this poetic wife is also the personification of wisdom and such that her characteristics are for men to pursue as well as women in order to live a godly life. So Proverbs 31 is for all people because the book of Proverbs as a whole is for all people And it's primarily pointing you to the kind of wisdom you need to lead. Now, maybe, again, because of how you've looked at this passage in the past, you're still thinking, well, really, it's mostly just about how young men should look for the right wife or about the kind of woman that a wife should be. And so if you're thinking that, let me just give you three lines of evidence in the text that show very clearly that This Proverbs 31 woman is a metaphor for the perfection of wisdom that we should all try to be like. The first reason is the structure of the book of Proverbs. So as you look at the book of Proverbs, chapters 1 through 9 are showing the difference between this metaphorical lady wisdom saying that if you work hard and live selflessly like her, like very few people want to do because that's difficult, then you'll have a life of blessing and honor, and it'll be glorifying to the Lord. You want to be like wisdom, but you want to avoid being like um, Lady Folly, 1 through 9 talks about. And Lady Folly is described as this wayward woman who would try to seduce you into momentary pleasure of maybe laziness or sexual immorality or gluttony. Momentary pleasures that would lead to a lifetime of pain. And then after those nine chapters contrast those two metaphorical women, chapters 10 through 30 show a bunch of wise sayings about how to be like Lady Wisdom in the personified sense. So then we get to chapter 31, and King Lemuel is saying, hey, you should pursue being like the perfection of Lady Wisdom, who's shown through this perfect wife in chapter 31, right? King Solomon is not writing Proverbs and giving us, right, 30 chapters of how to be like this metaphorical lady wisdom and then adding this last chapter on and being like, also, young man, future king, you should pursue uh, finding a wife and she needs to be like the mix of Wonder Woman, Rosie the Riveter, and the mom from the Brady Bunch. (laughs) That woman does not exist, What he's saying is he's saying you should pursue being like this perfect lady wisdom just like you would pursue the perfect woman if she existed. That's how valuable wisdom is for you, young future king. Second reason that men should pursue putting on these characteristics in this poem is that all the listed qualities of this perfect wife are just a summation, as you'd expect, of all of the qualities we've seen throughout the book of Proverbs, right? They're all summed up in what she is like. In fact, the poem is an acrostic poem, meaning that each line describing this woman starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet from Aleph to Tav, right, A to Z, showing that she's the whole package, right? This woman is the perfection of all things wisdom And she's a metaphor of how we need to pursue that kind of life. Now, if you're like still unconvinced by those two, uh, here's the nail in the coffin evidence. Look at verse 10. We just read it. It said, an excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. All right. And that is an exact quote from Proverbs 3.15, which says, lady wisdom 
is more precious than jewels, right? It's repeated again in Proverbs 8, 11, which says flat out again, lady wisdom is better than jewels and all that you desire cannot compare with her. The writer of Proverbs then is making a connection between this metaphorical lady wisdom and the perfect wife in Proverbs 31, saying we should pursue wise living like you would pursue an excellent woman. All right, so Proverbs is written in this chapter to women. It's written to young men. It's written to all people. And I want to point out one more specific category that this chapter applies to. Proverbs 31 is for the church. Right? This book 3,000 years ago connects to Grace Bible Church church members becoming Proverbs 31 church members today. And you're like, yeah, that's obvious. If it applies to all people, it applies to the church. But also in a very special sense, this passage connects to the church. Because in the New Testament, the church is described as the wife of wisdom, right? The bride of Christ. And so unsurprisingly, all of the characteristics of wisdom in this chapter are then directly commanded of the church in the New Testament, right? One example would be, we'll see a ton later, but one example is that this woman is called to keep her lamps trimmed and burning, working into the night, just as the church song says, that we're to keep our lamps trimmed and burning till the Lord returns, being ready. Right? Let me give you one scripture in the New Testament of the many that support this. Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, says that the bride of Christ, the church, on the final day of history, is going to be clothed in pure, bright white linen, which is the righteous deeds of the saints that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Now, there are two perfect brides that we've seen here in Scripture. There's this idealistic wife in Proverbs 31. So perfect. And then there's this clothed in white linen, idealistic wife in Revelation 19. And I don't think that that's an accident. I think that the writers are showing that there's a connection between this image of perfect wisdom and what the church is called to be today and going to be perfectly in the future. Lady wisdom is the church. Now here's the question. We have this ideal wife and this ideal church that are perfect in every way. But who among us has ever met a perfect woman or attended a perfect church, <laughs> right? Like none of you showed up to premarital counseling and were told, all right, this is what you're going to have to do because you're marrying a perfect wife. It never happened, right? And none of you has ever attended a perfect church, right? Like if you have, that was a cult. <laughs> you're just being deceived. No such thing exists, so what's going on in this chapter, right? Like why is this author holding up this impossible standard? Well, first, that's the next binder we have to take off. Binder one was it's just for women. Binder number two is thinking that Proverbs 31 is realistically attainable. Proverbs 31 is not realistically attainable for you or for me. You can't white knuckle your way into being like this lady, Here's three reasons why it's impossible. First, Lady Wisdom, we'll see in the next verse of the text, Lady Wisdom is tireless. Verse 11 says, The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. Right? The image here is of a wife who's constantly bringing increase of financial gain, of pleasure to her husband. It's an impossible picture of him having no lack of gain because of his spouse. In fact, later on, we're going to see that this wife of wisdom is a stay-at-home mom full-time while working two other basically full-time jobs that she runs on her own while getting up before the sun and staying up after the sun working. This is not physically possible in any of your calendars in life, <laughs> right? Now, one uh, commentator, a scholar I read, interestingly, said 
that you could interpret the verbs of this passage as all past tense verbs. And so if you did that, you could see all these impossible things that she does as just happening over different points of this woman's life, right? Like in the past, she was a stay-at-home mom, but now she runs a successful business. Like she used to get up early, but now she is a night owl that has shifted for her. And so maybe that would make this passage attainable. Maybe that would make her not tireless. Uh, But if that was the case, then you'd have King Lemuel saying to young teenage boys, you'd have his mother saying, "Uh, hey, teenage Lemuel, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to go find a wife who's already had a husband that became prominent as an elder in the gates. Um, he's, she's already raised children successfully. She has multiple business. She's run so well from the ground up. Uh, so teenage Lemuel, you need to find uh, a widow who is elderly and has just proven her character. Like, that's, that's not what it's saying in this passage. It's saying pursue the personification of wisdom, right? It's, it's a metaphor. So uh, it's for the church. It's a metaphor. She's tireless. Second, she is flawless. Verse 12 says, she does him good and not harm all the days of her life. <laughs> Let me ask you, spouses, have any of you ever done your spouse good and not harm all the days of your life. Romans 3 says, no, you've not. You've never measured up to the Proverbs 31 woman, and you never will on your own. I had a roommate back in college uh, who would often dispense the great wisdom that the perfect wife and the unicorn have a lot in common. They're both impossible to find, because neither of them exist, right? So, again, why is God holding up this impossible standard for men and women to pursue in wisdom? Like, that doesn't seem fair for us to have to attain to, right? What's God doing? Well, he's doing what he's always done throughout Scripture, right? He's doing what he did in the law, the prophets, the Ten Commandments, and now with Lady Wisdom, he's showing us our need for Jesus, right? You weren't meant to look at these passages in the Old Testament and say, man, I got this. Man, I'm going to be just like that. I'm just going to work it out on my own. No, you're meant to go, man, I am so sinful. How could I ever measure up to this? God, this doesn't seem right. Like, I need a savior, Lord. I need help. Which, of course, a thousand years after this book is written, God sends that savior, his name is Jesus. And 1 Corinthians 1.24 says Jesus is himself wisdom. Again, 1 Corinthians 1.30, Jesus is the wisdom of God. Again, Colossians 2.3 says in Jesus are hidden all treasures of wisdom and things to be known. So the only person who could ever possibly attain to Proverbs chapter 31 standards is Jesus, who is wisdom himself. So Lady Wisdom is tireless, she is flawless, and Lady Wisdom is Jesus, a picture of the Savior to come. So I tell you all this before we get to the meat of the text, because biblical theology has massive implications for how we interpret and apply the text of Scripture, especially this text to come, right? Because this text, again, is not just for the women. It's for the men in the room. And also, Proverbs 31 is not meant to be used as a club just to beat women over the head with and say, why don't you measure up to this standard, Right? So many women's Bible studies will say, like, man, this is exactly what you need to be like. Just work harder. Be like this woman. And so as I apply this passage to you as church members today, man, I hope you don't hear me saying, you better measure up to this standard or you are a failure in God's eyes. Right? Because in God's eyes, there is only one person who could ever meet this standard. And if you're in Christ, I mean, you have that wisdom of Christ dwelling in you. 
And so the good news for you and I this morning is that applying wisdom is no longer an impossible test, but it's an opportunity that we can joyfully work to embrace. It's just like when I was doing some woodworking with my father. Last weekend on Memorial Day, we tried to do this small woodworking project, and you should know that I barely have a handyman bone in my body at all. My father, on the other hand, has been blessed with a full set of handyman bones, all right? He's got the complete skeleton. And so we start this project, and I'm just, I'm clueless as to what we need to do to get started. Uh, I'm offering silly suggestions that a handyman would see as foolish. And yet, because I'm with my father, I know that this project is going to be brought to perfect completion, Because he's done this kind of thing a million times. Right? That's the good news of the gospel for you today if you are in Christ. That as you would seek to apply the perfection of wisdom in your life, first of all, you can celebrate that Jesus has already completed the perfection of it for you on your behalf. So all you have to do is believe this morning that the perfection of wisdom lived a perfect life, died on behalf of our foolishness, rose again conquering that foolishness then so that by faith in him you could be saved, have a new soul where the king of wisdom comes and abides inside of you by his spirit. How amazing is that? And then as you try to apply this passage, you're not trying to white-knuckle it through anymore. We're not holding up an impossible standard that we can't attain. No, we have the Father, we have the Master Carpenter himself with us while we work on Project Wisdom as church members in the 21st century. Praise the Lord. So let's get into it. Let's see what kind of attributes we can be putting on by the power of Christ working in us. There are four main categories that we see. Just to break it down, category number one is that the Proverbs 31 church member is hardworking. She is hardworking. In fact, she's so ridiculously hardworking, you're going to have to use three sets of comparisons to explain it. So first, she's hardworking mentally and physically. So I want you to see this in verses 13 through 19. Let's look at the text. It says, She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it's yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable, her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. So this woman is working hard at two jobs in this section. First, she's a clothes maker working with the distaff and the spindle. And she is also a vineyard manager. She's considering what fields are best. She's investing in them financially. She's planting and raising up crop and selling it. She's a successful entrepreneur, laboring at both the mental and physical aspects of her business. So, young men, looking for a wife to marry. You're looking for somebody who's hardworking. All right, cherry on top if she happens to have already started two successful businesses and keeps them going on her own. That's absolutely incredible. And church, this is what we're called to be. We're called to be hardworking both mentally and physically. Right In our belief and our behavior, we're to work for the Lord. This is all over every book of the New Testament. But let me give you just one verse uh, that we often miss. It's 2 Thessalonians 3.6. It says to the church, I quote, Keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness. Saying we as the church are to avoid having close-knit fellowship with someone who's walking in laziness in their workplace, in their pursuit of making more and better disciples. 
keep a distance from a brother who's walking in idleness. We're called to work hard mentally and physically. Second, this lady in Proverbs 31 works hard both in the morning and in the evening. Notice, verse 15 said, she rises while it's yet night. And verse 18, her lamp does not go out at night. So likely that means that she had enough money from her business or her family wealth as a queen to be able to keep her oil lamp burning all through the evening so she'd be getting up before the sun, staying up after the sun, working hard at these jobs. She works hard in the morning and the evening. Now we have to be careful here because the application for us is not to go burn ourselves out by never sleeping. The Bible mentions often it's good to rest, to vacation, to get a quiet moment with the Lord like Jesus did. And yet I think there's a fitting challenge for us 21st century church members who might tend to view church as just something that the professional ministers do, right? We do ministry and you just spectate and watch from the seats like you're doing right now, right? Rather, the vision in the New Testament is always, always for every member of the church to be doing ministry to one another. The vision is not just come on Sunday and also come on another week for a small group. I mean, that's great. But Hebrews says, don't neglect to meet together every day, as long as it's called today, encouraging one another each day, exhorting one another each day. So we're called daily. I mean, to find someone, your, your spouse, your kids, your neighbor, your coworker, speak the word of God, make disciples, be intentional at working hard day and night as a church member. We need one another in this process of what we're called to do. Lady Wisdom. She finally is hardworking both as a homemaker and an entrepreneur. In verse 27, she takes on the stay-at-home mom role. It says she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. (laughs) Yet, verse 24, breaks the traditional mold as she runs successful businesses. 24, she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. So once again, she exemplifies not just the ideal wife, but the ideal church member, right? Colossians 3.17, you know, says, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of the Lord. And in context, it's saying to do everything to the glory of the Lord at home, in the marketplace, and at work, everywhere that you go. So the first big bucket category of perfect wisdom of the Proverbs 31 church member is that she's hardworking. Second category, she is socially selfless. Describes the next eight or so verses, like the bulk of what's left, because the majority of the Proverbs are about being hardworking in your character and about being socially selfless in your interactions, how you think about and act and speak toward others. So unsurprisingly then, We get to the Gospel of Mark, and you see Jesus fulfill this when it says he came not to be served, but to serve others. And again, unsurprisingly, the church in every single book of the New Testament is called to live selflessly among those in their social networks. So let's see the eight different ways that the Proverbs 31 church member ought to be socially selfless. First, she helps the poor And the needy. Verse 20 says, She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. That's amazing because this woman is a queen. She's a filthy rich queen at that. And yet she's not too self absorbed to be associated reaching her hands out to the lowliest of people. And so, likewise, we in the church ought to be like Christ in Philippians 2 who is among the angels being worshipped in the throne of heaven, as we sang earlier, and yet comes to associate with the lowly to draw them in to the glory of God. That's what the church is called to be, sharing of our money and ourselves for the poor, as James talks about, for the widow and the orphan, sharing of the richness 
of our small group relationships and welcoming and inviting people who are not like us into this rich community of the Lord. Lady Wisdom helps the poor and needy. Second, she provides for her household. She provides for her household. Verse 21, she's not afraid of snow for her household. For all her household are clothed in scarlet. That's interesting because snow doesn't fall all that often in Israel. It happens, but not regularly. So this woman is thinking and planning and dreaming ahead and working hard to take care for the future needs of her household. So young men, let me ask, does that describe the kind of girl that you'd like to date? Right? Does she just tolerate being around her family? Or is this the kind of young woman who dreams and plans to serve the future needs of her household? Yeah, how about you, church member? I mean, do you just tolerate being around your family, your in-laws? <laughs> do you just tolerate being around your church family? Well, at least we're not that church over there, you know. Or are you thinking and dreaming and planning ahead for how you can serve and care for the future needs of the church body as more disciples continue to come in? 1 Timothy 5.8 says, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Acts 2, 44, and all who believed in the church were together and had all things in common. They were selling possessions and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. Lady Wisdom is generous to the needy. She's taking care of her household. Third, she takes care of herself. <laughs> you can't be selfless in taking care of others if you aren't first taking care of yourself. Right? There's a biblical principle there. That's why Jesus himself is getting up early in the morning and getting time alone with Jesus, with the Father, in the quiet of prayer before he then goes out and does the work of ministry. She takes care of herself. Verse 22 says, Wisdom, Lady Wisdom, makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. So modern translation, if you're a junior high boy who wants to date Lady Wisdom, step one is to listen to your mom when she says to take a shower and make your bed rather than spraying Axe body spray on your bed head. <laughs> Wisdom takes care of herself. Same thing in the New Testament. Man, in 1 Timothy, it's going to say that leaders in the church need to keep a close watch on the teaching and you need to keep a close watch on yourself. Persist in this, it says, for by doing that, you'll save both yourself and your hearers, right? So listen, church, you have to take care of yourself to serve others. You can't give directions to someone if you yourself don't know the way to go, right? You can't make a proper disciple of someone else if you yourself are not listening to the disciplers in your life. You can't help your kids know and follow Jesus if you don't even believe in him. You cannot minister to someone who needs the presence of Jesus today if you yourself haven't sat down in the presence of Jesus on your own. Wisdom takes care of herself so that she can selflessly serve someone else. Fourth, she makes her husband look good. Verse 23 says, Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Now we know that this particular verse is really important among this series of verses. Because this series of verses on living selflessly create a chiasm, right? You've probably heard of that. It's a literary structure from English class where the first and last part of this section 
go together. They're both about her opening her hands to other needy people, right? And then the second verse and the second to last verse go together. They're both about Lady Wisdom not fearing the future in some way. And then finally, in the middle of the chiasm, right, the center point, the focus of it, it says that she makes her husband look good. And that is absolutely applicational in so many ways. Let me just give a few for us. One is that a husband and wife's lives are inextricably linked to the point where what one does is always going to affect the other for better or for worse, right? That's why that's in the vows. And so for young people, it's going to take wisdom to make sure you marry in the Lord, that you're dating a Christian, that you're walking towards marriage with other wise people who are going to help counsel you in a godly way so that you're pursuing together Proverbs 31, wise living. Also, this inextricable linking between husbands and wives should encourage husbands to love and serve their wives well, amen? Because if you serve your wife well, Scripture's saying it's like you're serving yourself. <laughs> right? like if you serve your wife first, that's going to go well for you. Ephesians 5, he who loves his wife loves himself. Another good application of this principle is that just as the perfect wife makes her husband look good, and so the church is called in everything we do to lift up Christ and make him look good to the watching world such that people would see how we love each other and how we sing like we did this morning and they'd say like they did in 1 Corinthians 14, wow, and God is truly among his people here. He exists and he's moving in this church and their members. Fifth, Lady Wisdom carries herself with dignity. Verse 25 says, strength and dignity are her clothing. So she's not afraid of what others think of her. She's dignified. And then she uses that social strength to then love on others. And so likewise, we as the church, man, as children of God, have incredible dignity bestowed on us that we use then as kings and queens of the living God to then be ambassadors and share the gospel. Second Timothy, God gave us a spirit of not fear, but power, love, and self-control. So we carry ourselves with dignity. Sixth, Lady Wisdom looks to the future confidently. That's what it means when it says she laughs at the time to come. How many of you are laughing at the time to come this fall with the election season? <laughs> Lady Wisdom is confident that any future adversity or anxiety that will come is going to be taken care of because her God's with her. 1 John 4, 18, by this is love perfected with the church that we, so that we may have confidence for the final day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So church, we can look forward confidently to our future persecutions and hardships included, knowing that God's gonna use every bit of it for our good, working out this wisdom project in our lives until that final day when we show up as this perfected bride of Christ in white linens by the grace of Jesus Christ. Seventh, Lady Wisdom speaks wisely. Verse 26 says, she opens her mouth with wisdom, All right? Much of the book of James echoes that, using our words wisely in the church. I'm going to keep moving. Last thing, Lady Wisdom speaks kindly. It says, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue, right? Ephesians 4, only use speech that is good for building up. That's what the church is to do. Lady Wisdom never then puts others down or compares herself to them. Right? Lady Wisdom is probably going to confront you to your face at times, but she's never going to talk poorly about you behind your back. She's using words 
of kindness. So largely, she is hardworking and socially selfless, but briefly, the text gives us two more main categories that ought to describe the Proverbs 31 church member. Let's glance at them. The next is that she is praiseworthy. She's praiseworthy. Verse 28 says, Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also praises her, saying, Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. So God says, verse 31, Give her the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. So once again, there's a lot of applications that we can make from this text. One is that husbands ought to publicly encourage their wives for how they see the grace of God in them. I am so thankful for a wife who's pursuing the wisdom of Jesus. It is a huge gift. Another application is to see parallels here between, again, this wife and the church. Even in this passage, there's a parallel from the beginning where Lady Wisdom gave of the fruit of her hands in the gate to serve others, and now she receives generously from the works of her hands which praise her in the gate from her husband and from the Lord. I mean, that sounds a lot like a socially selfless, hardworking church member today who would spend their life working for things that last into eternity, right? Making more and better disciples and multiplying with their time, talents, and treasure. And then on the last day, the, the uh, parable would say that the master comes home and God would say to that servant, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, you've been faithful with a little. I'm gonna set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. She is praiseworthy. And finally, this Proverbs 31 church member is known for fearing God above all else. Verse 30, charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So the primary descriptor for Lady Wisdom is not anything about how she looks or appears on the outside, but it's who she loves on the inside. But she's a woman who fears God above all else. So again, young men looking to date and women who are trying to be this wise character, this is repeated in the New Testament. First Peter 3 says the kind of woman you want to be or look for is not a woman of outward adorning, but a woman with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit that fears the Lord. How beautiful is that? That is the perfect woman in God's sight. She fears God above all else. Likewise, church members, I pray that we'd be known for fearing the Lord above all, like the church in Acts 2, when it said they devoted themselves to teaching fellowship, bread, and prayer, and awe, fear, awe of God came upon every soul in their midst, then again, Acts 9.31, the church in all Judea and Samaria and Galilee had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. And so I hope you are encouraged this morning. I want to encourage you in that as I look at Grace Bible Church, I mean, I see so many hard-working individuals serving the Lord and one another throughout the week, especially on Sunday mornings. Man, I see so many brothers and sisters and hear so many stories of people selflessly loving on others in life groups, right? meeting physical needs, showing up at hospitals, making meals, watching kids for one another, praying for one another and seeing answers, discipling one another. I mean, there's such a great community to be connected to here. I see Proverbs 31 church members here who are making disciples that we're going to see that fruit on the final day of history and it's going to be praiseworthy. And I just thank the Lord and for a church that is aiming to fear him above all else. Man, I heard that and how we were singing and worshiping him this morning. And so I hope you're encouraged. I mean, that Jesus is alive 
with his people and working these things out, which he's already accomplished for us. And so, however this text challenges you and convicts you as it does me, that there's still areas where God's working on this wisdom project in our lives to become Proverbs 31 church members. And I hope you pursue it in joy, knowing that you work on that project with the master carpenter going alongside you. So let's pray. And we, Father, and what a gift to get to walk with Jesus, who is himself wisdom. Thank you. Thank you for sending him for people like us. Thank you that we get to live in this church age where we walk with you and we can look back on how you've accomplished the perfect life on our behalf. God, I pray right now for anyone who does not believe in Christ's life and death on their behalf. And church, would you pray with me? And let's pray, God, for that person, that man or woman who may be in this room today and does not have saving faith. Lord, would you open their eyes by your work so they would see and believe and get to dwell with wisdom and walk with you. Man, there's nothing that would be better. You're worth more than jewels and fine gold and every treasure that we could desire, every good thing. And so, Lord, I pray for every man and woman, every member of our church today, Lord, that we joyfully continue forward in following you in the project that you're working out in us, that one day you're going to make us the perfected bride of Christ practically, even as we are positionally right now. So we praise you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, friend, thank you for letting us be a part of your day. We pray that this sermon has helped you to love Jesus more. As a church, we are on the mission of making more and better disciples of Jesus Christ by teaching everything that Jesus has commanded through the Word of God. So if this resource has blessed you, we ask that you'd share it then with others and follow up with us on our webpage that is found in the description. We look forward to hearing from you and connecting with you soon as we pursue Jesus together.